I'm Turk Strongman at Tone Freak Bass Experience. In this video, I'm going to share a story with you, a true story, from a book that I wrote, Wild and Free on the Lower East Side, Nine True Stories from the 70s and 80s in New York City. <clears throat> This book survived a fire, as you can see. It has burn and smoke damage. The story is in memory of Louisa. The opening quote by Mark Twain, right here, says, I cannot call to mind a single instance where I have ever been irreverent, except toward the things which were sacred to other people. <clears throat> Stolen bones and gold fascinated Jimmy and I, but our fascination went beyond a simple obsession and fell more accurately into the perverse realm of increasingly morbid desire. The triteness and the vanity of everyday life bored us, until our souls reached toward more sublime stimulations. We lived in cold, dark places, among shadows thrown by votive candles purchased from superstitious Caribbean women. Our poetry evolved into sacrilegious, vulgar expressions in proper literary form, and our studies delved into the darkest subjects. We carved our jewelry from ancient ivory and bone pieces, and from gold that we had clandestinely acquired from places of worship. From these practices, we experienced satisfaction in proportion to the general deviance of the symbolism that we found in them. Finally, we spoke of finding better things upon which to burn our candles to prevent fire. And we spoke of finding gold, the loss of which would not offend its previous owner, for we never intended harm. We felt convinced that grave robbing was the overall solution to both problems. Yet we felt that dishonoring the dead in this manner might somehow defile us. We doubted our capacity to follow through. But as we further considered the act and its implications, we found no actual evidence supporting our initial inhibitions. Instead, we now believed that if performed with a genuineness and purity, then the act stood meritoriously to bring again to the light of day adornments once worn with pride by a now-past soul, and to wear them with respect for that soul in a loving celebration of its eternal life. That was now our aim. But we could not tell others the same. For we could not determine whether any other person could comprehend our intensity of reverence for the dead and of our appreciation for life. So with these beliefs, we secretly and solemnly vowed to wait. Wait as patiently as God himself for God to present us with an appropriate opportunity.
We left the Lower East Side and the city in general. And we traveled north. We traveled north to stay for a few months in the mountains of upstate New York. We camped in a cabin owned by Jimmy's family. The respite felt reviving. And we took advantage of exploring the woods daily. Eventually, we stumbled upon a large meadow area, at the far end of which a brushy slope extended out of sight into a grove of scattered trees. Imagine how our, our excitement mounted as we realized that among the shrubs and grass, the slope held an array of tilting and half-sunk gravestones. We engaged ourselves in examining names, dates, and epitaphs, and otherwise opened the doors of our intuitions and our hidden senses to serve as guides to the site of our imminent excavation. Careful studies of thirty or so stones led it to no result. But at last, a simple stone stood before us, inscribed with the words, Louisa A. Carr, 1822 to 1840, married 1839. And beside this stone leaned another, with the inscription, Dr. Robert M. Carr, 1801 to 1843, married. 1839. Tremendous compassion overwhelmed us. We felt the sorrow of this gentleman, doctor, and we imagined the beauty of his young bride, Louisa. We loved the life she knew, and now we loved her in her death, and the sensual charm of her immortal soul entered Jimmy and I until we felt her longing feminine warmth surround us. The next night would be Halloween Eve and a full moon would light our way. We would return and we would free Louisa's spirit from its bonds to a cold dark grave and we would take the light of her memory out into the world again. At the same time, in a foreign plane, our souls would eternally meld with hers. And we, Jimmy and I, we would attain the rare knowledge of having willfully instrumented these sacred transmutations. We would share equally in spirit until long after the crumbling of bone and gold into elements. Jimmy and I started back to the site a bit before sundown the following day with a pick and a shovel, a lantern, a flashlight, and a bucket with a rope for when we got down deep. The job immediately presented a difficulty. Louise's stone and those surrounding it stood tilted, leaning, and sunken somewhat. But worst of all, they appeared to have crept downhill subsequent to their original positionings. So we performed a slip calculation. We accounted for natural earth movements, stone versus wooden box positioning, probable soil layer differences, erosion, slope, and root integrity. After reaching consensus on the spot, most likely to bear good fruit. 
we knelt in prayer for a moment. And again, we opened our hearts to Louisa. And then set our minds to our work. We shared the shovel as we tore loose and lifted the first bit of sod. As we took turns picking and shoveling, at first our moods were light. We told jokes and we made up poetic phrases about our activity and fantasized romantically about Louisa. But never did we blaspheme her in her life or in her death. We did, however, consider in an ethereal manner her divinely sexual potency co-mingling with ours. We laughed at ourselves over that, reveling in our natures. And then our moods went silent and we sweated through hard dirt. After more time, we rested and observed the full moon. In the silver light, our tranquil surroundings looked perfectly matched to our enterprise. And again, we noted the October day of the year. Surely God had provided us this earthly venture. And then we got back to digging the hole. Three o'clock in the morning found us still turning up soil and in well over our heads. We had expected to have hit wood by then. No doubt we had started at the wrong spot, provided the six-foot rule applied to two all burials but we couldn't be off by any great margin. The only question was in which direction. We reformulated our strategy, hoping to correct our error, and we picked into the downslope wall of the hole. But the narrowness of our original dig afforded us minimal angulation, and the going soon got tough. Soon the light of dawn would end our search no matter what. But on we went, reluctant to face the truth. Eventually, however, our sweat dripped more in vain. Our hopes turned to resignation. And our painful admissions, painful admissions of defeat, overtook our perseverance. Jimmy and I never did discern why it turned out that after having been led to come so close on that perfect night and with such a pure direction, we carried back to the cabin only the implements that we had carried from it to the night before. We continued to burn our candles on saucers and to fashion our jewelry from mundane things. We continued on with our lives as they were. Now, I indicated at the beginning that this is a true story. But to tell the truth, Jimmy and I swore to never tell whether we'd in fact broken through the box and plundered the treasures of Louisa. So even here, I do not guarantee the truth about that. We're certain, though, Jimmy and I will carry Louisa in our journeys forever.